Welcome everyone uh, to our lecture today titled On Global Caste and Blackness by Dr. Suraj Yankri and mod moderated by Professor Barry Moore Books. Uh, my name is Rhythm and as the undergraduate Doug leader for the Cent Center for Contemporary South Asia here at Brown University, um, I would like to formally introduce our speaker for the event today, uh, Dr. Suraj Yangre. Um, Dr. Yangre is India's leading public intellectual and noted scholar of caste, um, currently a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and an inaugural postdoctorate fellow at the Initiative for Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability at Harvard. He is involved in developing a critical theory of Dalit and Black studies. Um, Dr. Yangre has been nominated for India's highest literary award, the Sahitya Academy, and is a recipient of the Dr. Ambedkar Social Justice Award and the Rohit Vermeula uh, Memorial Scholar Award. Um, last but not least, of course, Dr. Yangri is an author of the bestseller, Cast Matters, and the co-editor of the award-winning, The Radical in Ambedkar. Uh, we're honored to have you here with us, sir. The moderator for our event today is Professor Barry Moore Books from Brown University. Um, Professor Books is a writer, scholar, curator, and the director for the Center, of Slavery, uh, for Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. He's a professor of Africana Studies, the Royce Professor of Teaching Excellence, and currently the Asa Messer Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory. Uh, I also want to thank Arjun Nair for bringing Dr. Yangre to us and helping organize this event. Um, our conversation today will be 45 minutes long with 15 minutes in the end for questions. So I encourage you to use the chat function to ask any questions which I will be collecting. Um, yeah, with that, I hand it over to Professor Books. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rhythm. And uh, thank you. Well, welcome to everyone on, uh, on this Sunday morning. Um, uh, and uh, welcome to Dr. Yenge, um, to, to the Watson and Brown. I am you know, honored to be, to be part of this uh, conversation. Uh, what I thought we could do, and we discussed this um, on, as we were preparing for this uh, program, was that um, I would probably, I will begin by posing a set of questions and then hopefully to Dr. Yenge, and then hopefully that would uh, stimulate a set of conversations uh, between us. Then we will go to a Q&A uh, from the participants. Um, and then I will probably, and then if we have time, we'll leave the last word to Dr. Yenge. And so let me again welcome everyone and uh, throw, the first, throw the first question on to Dr. Yenge. Uh, you have written this really explosive book, uh, Cast Matters. Explosive, I say, because it opens uh, intense debate and discussion. Um, that is sometimes silenced. Right. Um, and so I wanna ask, why did you write this? I wanna begin by asking, why did you write this? Uh, first of all, uh, a very good morning and good evening, and sometimes it's good night for some of our friends tuning in from Japan. Uh, I would uh, accept my uh, greetings to everybody here. Uh, at the outset, let me thank Arjun Nair uh, for really being consistent uh, that this dialogue happens, and I'm grateful for his uh, devotion. Also, Rhythm Rastogi, for creating this, uh, and of course, the great Professor Barry Moore Bogues, uh, whose work we continue to learn a lot, especially when we try to understand the slavery in the Caribbean and in the larger context of this part of the world. So I think this conversation that we have today has many meanings to me personally, Professor Bogues, <clears throat> simply because the idea of slavery has also has to extend uh, to certain uh, corridors of intellectual thought which might not necessarily ascribe the quote-unquote slavery status and I refer to my group my community in South Asia uh, whose experiences uh, were slave-like without the commerce being part of it. Um, uh, the book that I wrote uh, in a way was initially written as you know as a very armchair academic uh, with a lot of, you know, um, uh, continental philosophy, uh, as well as the humanist, humanities uh, that went through me describing. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, 
during the process, the publisher uh, thought it would be better to not make it too jargon specific and, and make it publicly accessible doctrine. Uh, and, and that's why I think the language and the way I argue uh, was having a moment. I mean, this was not my doctoral dissertation. Mm -hmm. I, when I came to Harvard, I, I interacted with uh, many African-American scholars as well as the Africanist uh, scholars here. And, and then I realized that this was a moment perhaps for me to then now uh, talk about my community uh, in a way, in a language uh, that could be potentially be something that the 21st century will have to grapple and wrestle with. And it was very much a Du Boisian inspiration that I got from, of course, is the question of color line being the 19th century, uh, 20th century problem. And I was thinking, what will be the 21st century problem? And that's why I think uh, at the early decades of this uh, century, I wanted to frame an argument that could uh, help us collectively think not only about South Asia, but also across the uh, globe and, and the importance of caste. What, what is that argument? What's the core of that argument? One thing uh, is, uh, so, so there are two. Uh, one is uh, the rejection of Dalit humanity. I, I'm, I'm making a case for Dalit humanity. Uh, and the uh, second is uh, when, 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 uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the larger project of emancipation, I'm asking for liberation. And I think I try to juxtapose this by arguing for the Dalit humanity and Dalit universalism. We are not really confined to one space or one, uh, one attitudes, but there are multiple locations, multiple thought processes that we work through as well as uh, we have uh, manifold aspirations that do not necessarily are uh, monolithic. Uh, they are very much poly and they ought to be poly for us to have various ingredients of this uh, liberation doctrine. So I think that's what I was trying to argue through this. Yeah, I, I want to come back later on to this idea of Dalit um, emancipation versus Dalit humanity because I want to link it to um, so questions of, uh, of race and, 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 and blackness um, and the ways in which questions of uh, emancipation and liberation work in, in right. black political thought. But I want to go, I want to uh, press a bit about this, about Dalit humanity to say, could you just say exactly what you mean? Um, <clears throat> so the humanness was never uh, privileged to the Dalit body. As we know, the caste system operated uh, with the outcasted labor and body of a huge mass of people who were declared untouchables. And by untouching, they also were made unseeables and unapproachables. That means they were far removed from the scathing attitudes of basic humanity. And, and because of that, the Dalits were termed subhuman uh, for, for, for so long. And the subhumanity was given only uh, because the extraction of labor was there. One could extract the labor, but yet not give the status of full human. And we were put under this for close to 3,500 years. Uh, and it was more rigidified uh, in, 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 since 2,000 years. And, and so what we see is uh, there is a constant claim on behalf of Dalits uh, for their humanity. They ask and they compete and they contest as fellow human beings. They want to petition, uh, they want to claim uh, a success as human beings. They want to cry as human beings. And I think the basic humanity is not even attributed. And even now today, an assault on Dalit is not considered an assault on humanity. An assault on Dalit is considered an assault on a Dalit. And it is normalized in India. Uh, uh, as well as when you talk about a, a brutal rape on a Dalit woman, it doesn't spark a humanitarian response. It sparks only a response. And that's why we have a very difficult uh, uh, situation uh, where even our equal status is not recognized. And, and for that, the legislations and the constitution might ascribe to us 
but the psychology of people still does not want to warrant us that. And that's why I wanted to make a forceful argument almost on your face to say that we are also humans, but also not just humans, but humans who are striving for dignity, striving for wellness, striving for equality. Uh, we just don't live life uh, as a passive human being, but very much an active a co-participant of making this moment, a very much uh, a construction worker of this civilization that we are trying to, trying to lead. And of course, uh, I, I, I forcefully also put forward that we want to be the ruling class, the one who want to uh, take control of our own affairs, as well as an affairs that you are failed, you will also able to run those uh, under our leadership. Yeah, I, the, the idea of touching um, is a really important one. And one, as I listen to you, um, uh, my mem I'm reminded of a sex sex section of black skin and white mask, because I'm sure you have read, in which Fanon talks about uh, our ability to touch or lack of ability to touch each other is actually um, uh, is a sign of or a certain kind of uh, inhumanity, and uh, that therefore the, he calls for uh, the ability for us to touch each other. And, and, and what, I'm, what I hear you saying, which I, which I, you know, which I think is important, is that uh, if you, uh, for, for uh, groups that are oppressed um, through caste, and then I would argue then through race, what you are seeing is that at the root of, part of the root of that oppression is a certain kind of uh, uh, human hierarchy, classification or schema in which some people are not on the scale of, not on the human scale at all, and therefore can be treated as disposable and can be treated as any, any, any in, treated in any way. Would that be an accurate assessment and of, what you're, of what you're trying to work through? Indeed, as, as you can see, the whole Enlightenment era project of, of course of the past 500 years was devoted to uh, remove the humanity of uh, other color or, or, or a non-European descent a race, as we know, the whole canon was developed, but that was partly inspired from, and that's what we, we have to pay attention to the early Enlightenment era thinkers, like of course Hegel, but also Kant, how, how they closely studied the Hindu texts, how much they were aware of the caste system, very much where otherizing was essentialized, mm -hmm. was very much central uh, to the principles of how to govern and how to run the forthcoming, you know. And, and the basic premise of an, any uh, controlling mechanism uh, was to own uh, the time and space. And, and, and not only the time of the present, but that also of the future. And I think it is where uh, the Dalits become an important element because uh, they have been sustaining uh, dehumanization and the time and space was never accorded to them. They had to live on the pittance as well as the favorables of the person or the entity that was controlling and ruling them. That's why they were ostracized outside the villages. That's why their women folk were available for sexual abuse and exploitation. That's why the, the men folks were available uh, for again, sexual gratification by the women folk of the dominant caste but also uh, for their labor that they brought alongside, of course, the children and, 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 and the women folks. Now, the, 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 the cosmology of uh, Indian village political economy operated on removing any hints that would make the untouchable labor feel that he is someone who can claim not even fight for, but even if you claim that, and I think to remove that, religious texts were deployed. And a certain sanctity was ascribed to justify the oppression. And I think when it comes to, you know, very much Fanonian and, and you know, I myself have heavily inspired uh, by Fanon and, 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 and when I see these dualisms that even Fanon tries to tackle between uh, the colonized as well as the new a colonizer as, as he identifies what after colonization. Uh, in, in, in this very much sense, uh, what we are tackling is the phenomenology 
of a Dalit being. People have not really understood. It is a stigmatized body that continues to walk through many arrows every day pointing towards them. And, 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 and how then do you still manage to not only survive, but aim for something higher than yourself? And, 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 and through that channel, that's why I'm very devoted to my ancestors who were, who were born as untouchables. Yet they never gave up on thinking that the next generation will be better than us. And I think that's, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's to them that you know, we, we, kind to, we, we tend to uh, 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 broaden uh, our horizon of where can we then take our next generation. Okay, great. Uh, in the in the book, you you write that um, that caste is not just violence against the other. You say, but that there is a certain bio individualistic way aspect of caste. Um, what do you mean by that? How, 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 I think it's probably linked to the last point you made. But could you could you explore that a bit with us? Right. I think you know this is interesting because. Uh, because many times what has happened is people have uh, uh, mentioned or talked about caste as a structure, as a macro uh, uh, perspective, which, it, which as much as it is true, but when we talk about Dalit experience, it is about the individualism. It is about how they interact uh, with others as a human body, as well as negotiate themselves. They, the, the Dalit body is a carrier of anti-caste virus. They want to destroy that. They want to overcome uh, the, the, the caste aspirations. And, and so uh, when, we, when, we, when we talk about caste, and there is usually a prevalent argument that caste uh, is you know, uh, a, a violence against community and stuff like that, which is just true. Dalits are attacked for being Dalit as a community, not only as an individual, but also there is a certain individuality to that that invites this form of repression upon their bodies and upon their minds. And when I say bio-individualistic, what I, what, I, what I mean to say is it, is it is confined to the biologism of a Dalit being. I had made argument that Indian caste civilization is afraid of Dalit semen and Dalit blood. And to the fear of these two fluids, they have created an entire structure of oppressive caste system to preserve their civilizations. Of, of, of a certain Brahminic Hindu order. And, and, and in that, of course, uh, various phases of Islamic and other foreign kingdoms that came to India also were invested in rooting that forms of violence upon the bodies of Dalit. And, and so, uh, so, so, so a Dalit walking into a space not meant for a Dalit to be there is creating more troubles because the individual is not meant to be there. And that's why there are individual injunctions. What time can you get out of your house? How much of your shadow can pollute other grounds? And, and what type of food you can consume? Where can you participate? Who can you marry? Who can you eat with? There are so many injunctions on a Dalit life. And I think those are attributed. It, it, and it was a law, by the way. It was by, by legality. What we have Jim Crow, we had a Jim Crow for more than 2000 years which was very strictly enforced and had a spiritual sanction. And I think this is how I try to try to make an argument about the bio-individualism in, in the process of a Dalit as well as non-Dalit bodies in this. Okay, so, I'm, but if we think about it, I mean, the individual structure is always related or typically related to the, a, a social structure. Um, there is a, you know, there's a very symbiotic relationship between the, the, the one and the many. Um, so that's between the structure and the individual. And, and, and I wanted to ask you, how, how do you see the, that relationship? And do you think that, how does that relationship, um, how is that relationship mediated through, say, um, a social a system, an economic system, and, um, like capitalism? So you mean to say the individual relationship? I'm to, yeah, I'm saying that both the, there's a, always a relationship between the individual and the social. The That's right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and so I'm trying to think about um, in terms of the, uh, how, does, how does a system like capitalism, a social economic system like capitalism, how does it shape 
um, the uh, Dalit oppression. That's right. Um, I think, and, and, and I think this is a, uh, you know, uh, some sort of a, a colonial time conversation that people are also having about how do we then ascribe this individuality to the, to the structure of oppression and capitalism and how then it, you know, interacts with that. And I think what I also try to argue through this book is how uh, uh, capital uh, uh, centric institutional reformations are also limited to provide that avenues of freedom of liberation that Dalits are asking for. I mean, the project of Dalits is not just to, you know, um, uh, adjust or assimilate or, or, or try to accommodate certain, but, but they also want a total complete freedom and annihilation of an oppressive structure like caste. And I think through that lens, when we, when we see how the personal is, is, co is, is co-joined to social, I, I don't want to I don't want to remove the sociality of a Dalit experience, but but what what I what I also make is that people in in, in a caste structure do not let Dalits be individuals. And 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 by 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 that what they want is they want the Dalit to cry if the community is crying. They want they want a very homogeneous structuring of a Dalit experience. And and if there is a a, a certain thing on Dalit, other Dalit the society the hegemonic society wants us. Uh, to to react as a as a common par, uh, as as a common being. Now that might be true, but in the you know among Dalits themselves, there are close to twelve hundred forty six castes, and each caste has its own sub sub castes. So in it, so it's 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 a structure, and it's not only among Dalits. Brahmins also have close to five hundred and fifty sub castes, and and so for every other group, the the macro caste has many sub sub castes among them, and so. When we when we when we when we associate the sociality uh, to these individual aspirational groups, then what we do is we often miss out on their individual aspirations. You know, and sometimes some groups associate uh, with capital intensive work, and they are like, we are fine, we want to work. But also there are certain groups who stand radically opposite, uh, almost uh, to to challenge it, and, and that's why there is a lot of in group fight, you know friction as well as conversation that continue to uh, take place. And 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 I think that was my Kind of a very much, you know, large argument, uh, you know, as 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 an ethic of a Dalit being cannot be associated with the commonality of of them, uh, but but there are also individual experiences, and I think that also invited uh, uh, some sort of uh, disagreement with with some set of scholars uh, who 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 thought that I was trying to create more division among the among the Dalits, uh, which unfortunately was not correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, that may, and that's one of the reasons why I asked you because I've, I've seen the criticism that says that the, that you are privileged the individual as opposed to um, as opposed to or well in opposition to right. in a very binary way the um, the, the, the sociality uh, the commonness of of, of, of oppression um, of, of of the Dalit group. Let let me you you're working on. You're working on the relationship between Dalit and blackness, and I wanted to uh, to shift to shift gears a bit and ask you about the um, how do you see that relationship between caste and race? Um, and and let me let me um, posit a, a statement here um, from really, uh, one of the most important sociologists, black sociologists in the United States. Uh, Oliver Cox and, and his book, 1949 book, um, you know, on uh, caste, uh, class, and race, in which, um, in, you know, which uh, Oliver Cox argues that race is a physical identity, and I'm summarizing over 500 yeah. pages here. So race is a physical identity, he says, um, uh, but caste, but and a caste um, is able to identify, Oliver Cox says, um, a man because he knows what he is, or he's known for what he is, i.e. therefore he's known to be a Dalit or some other caste. While in, for race, um, Cox says, a man is known because of how he looks. Um, uh, so that there's a, there's a question of, um, of phenotype and there's a question of, um, of lack of phenotype, if you want to put it that way, as a form as a visible form of difference, 
And I wanted to ask you what was, the, this is written 49, but what do you think about that? And, and how do you see the relationship between caste and, and race? You know, um, uh, Professor Cornel West asked me to read his book and, you know, summarize, I mean, he said, just let me know your response. And so I had started reading a thick book, you know, extremely insightful. And, uh, and I was, I, you know, I actually had written early on somewhere in some, some, not in this book, but somewhere else, I wrote an article where, how did he manage to write without even visiting the place? I mean, I mean, that's, that's in a way, both way is, it, it could be a genius, like he's arguing so incisively about the Hindu system, like he's describing mm -hmm. uh, the Brahmin, how a Brahmin reacts to certain rituals. And, and, I, and I was thinking, and yet he has not gone. If that book was written, and that's a sociology field, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, many reviewers would be like, why don't you go and do field work? You know, in, in, in yeah. contemporary times, it would have been difficult. And, and so um, there are some arguments that Oliver Cox is making uh, which 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 we should pay uh, serious attention to, and and which I am also you know uh, you know uh, supporter uh, uh, of of especially when he is uh, you know arguing for the nuances and the differences between caste and race, uh, which you know. But as we know, uh, uh, you know, Cox was himself limited in many many ways. Uh, one of course he didn't pay attention to the scholars of caste who were writing during his time. One of them, of course, being Ambedkar, he, I mean, I'm sure he, wa he would have known by now, uh, but somehow that prob probably, I mean, you know, by this time, 1949, Ambedkar had written enormous treatises uh, on, on the question of untouchability. He had also written, I mean, early on about theorizing the caste system. But that very, you know, uh, that somehow, somehow we, we don't get enough of that. Uh, however, uh, Oliver Cox's argument was also the phenotypical, uh, you know, gesturing of race where you know he made a, a comment about uh, race as being a constant uh, you know uh, in friction because a person who is as he uses the word the negro uh, is 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 striving to fight you know there is always a movement whereas he says caste in a way is uh, has stabilized he had mentioned that uh, the people who are lower caste or the dalits have accepted their status because of the karma and that theory when he's arguing is partly correct from what books he has read because there is one theory that argues for that and and and, and he basically thought that's that's how we could you know differentiate and of course uh, the second aspect was about race and that has led me to read about genetic theory to see about you know how did race uh, came and, and and that's that's one of my you know been uh, uh, interest since past two years where i'm reading more closely how uh, genomes and how how, how this uh, new study in the, in the in the genetics field especially and also archaeology help us to understand. And, and, and as we see, race and caste technically are European terms. Uh, caste comes from Iberia, uh, especially when, 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 we, when we look at its foundation and, and how, how it, it you know, of course, the name is, is evolved, but ascribed to, to an otherness. But, but the experiences of those can be catalog, cataloged in, 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 in this. And so, Oliver Cox's rejection of caste and race uh, as 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 a similar uh, of or, you know identical forms, and that's a sociological approach, uh, is validated up to an extent because the debate has to then further as to what do I make of race and caste, what do I make of the structures of oppression, the structure of function in various societies, and where do I take this? And I think that is this is where uh, I disagree with Oliver Cox. Uh, where you know there are more similarities to these conversations of race as a system of control, as a system of oppression, as as, as a differentiation. Because as we know, uh, the the biological argument is rejected when it comes to the the, the racial, uh, and, and similarly, uh, the biological argument to caste is also rejected because uh, because you know you have lighter skin Dalits as well as darker skin Brahmins. So this this kind of you know evolves to through it. But I'm not concerned about the immediate apparentness of race and caste, because it is more confusing. It is more confusing for a, for example, a person who, for example, sees you would be difficult to place because for some people, the color has to do with Africa and their hairstyle and, you know, nose. And so there are various ways of this, what we call cephalic index formation of whatever we did, but there are structures under which decent based hierarchies, existing in society where there are lowest caste who are providing their labor 
and value to the dominant caste, where dominant castes are controlling the entirety of that. And I think this is where uh, you know new uh, phase of study I think has to has to expand in in in, in this in this I think at least I'm, that's what I'm trying to uh, propagate uh, through my research and and writing in forthcoming times. Okay, but let me ask a question because in the certainly within the American context, to think about race is to think about blackness. Um, and to think about blackness is to think about the, you know, a, his, a history, not just of racial slavery, but things that are one, the one drop rule. Yeah. Um, when you have one drop of black blood, then you are, you are considered black. Uh, and therefore, um, to, to, to think about race is to think about forms of racial subjugation and to think about, okay, how does one map that, um, not just sociologically, but economically, politically, socially, and so on, how does one map um, a racial subjugation? And therefore, how does, um, particularly then on, if you follow that argument, um, then you would think about, okay, how does blackness, which then is posited by the dominant hegemony as inferior, then um, is flipped around by those persons who are black to become um, to become a political category of, of possibility of change and reform. So um, what I'm so how does the, to think about it in that way, um, not to limit, not to can, not to um, to say okay to to um, to Oliver Cox that you are right, but to try and try and thinking through um, that although race is both race and caste are not. Are you know are historical fictions and and, and 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 social fictions in many ways that they also have a certain kind of material reality, um, and then to try and think about okay, how does uh, what's the similarities in those in that in that, um, and and what are the differences because the the historical there's a certain kind of historical specificity I think to oppression that one always has to uh, to take account of. And I think I am with you on that, especially with the aspect of materiality and what do we do with this. The Americanized experience of race is, uh, I'm sure you will agree, is different, at least with the other experiences of racialized societies that, that we have. Uh, and, and, and also I think Cox was also somehow, of course, being a Trin Trinidadian himself, right. uh, you know, grew up around uh, other Indians as well, who, you know, who were also fairly dark skinned. Uh, and, and that's what I, that's why I am very, gentle towards Cox simply because of his life experiences and of course he was writing from Chicago uh, mm -hmm. where his contemporaries were arguing something else who were white by the way uh, mm -hmm. barring Alison Davis uh, who himself was a, a black anthropologist of the era uh, but many others who wrote on this were and, and, and I think that has to do with uh, with 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 with, uh, with 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 how we develop those cat conceptual categories and I think uh, caste and race as a, as, as a concept of solidarity or, or a concept of movement that could connect on the materiality beyond uh, anthropologizing uh, too much of these experiences. And I think there is a lot of scope to that because the racialized or racialization that happened in post-colonial or colonial, or, you know, now post-colonial societies, or sometimes some people call it still continuing colonial societies, uh, is, is very much prevalent because uh, you might not have a, 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 a lighter skinned person uh, in your country but your economy, your social structures are controlled by the person uh, who would identify you as a, a lower race or, or, or lower caste. But race then, uh, Professor Bokes, I think has also a uh, need to expand, uh, you know, its, 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 its strictness in the sense that uh, the oppositeness has almost confined to the white man, especially the 20th century politics of African-Americans, Du Bois and all others, where the idea of uh, uh, you know, connecting uh, to the to the uh, you know um, uh, against the white supremacist you know regimen that was existing, the colored people solidarity that worked. But for me, that there was a there was a clear kind of contrast. But for me, that was just not limited to the color contrast. But it was to do with the uh, with the control of economy and resources by a certain geographical location. In this case, Europe and now America. Uh, you know, who wants to, of course, expand to this. So, so how do we then explain a black Barack Obama, actually African and white uh, mix uh, Obama, uh, trying to, you know, run the imperial order of America across the world? 
or in that case, you know, many other countries run by, especially India also participant uh, to creating more neo-colonial fights in, 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 in this ways. And I, and I think that's why uh, the oppressed people of each communities, uh, black within black, the oppressed among the blacks is what my concern is. Uh, because as we know, the, the ethnic divides as well as the tribal divisions that we have in various societies where people from the lowest strata of their respective societies never got opportunity to be negotiators or, 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 or people who could deal as, as equals. And, and for that purpose, I am hoping to get the black and Dalit as an approach instead of, if you will, caste and race. You know what I mean? Because the caste and race will further complicate uh, this, but, but doesn't mean I'm not open to that. Yeah, what you're saying reminds me very much of a particular section of uh, the Boyce's Black Reconstruction, yeah. which, he, I, which he calls for um, a solid, really human solidarity between all people of color um, and all um, people, so-called natives um, at the time, because he's writing in 1935, so he's writing in, uh, you know, um, British colonialism is not yet finished, or uh, the entire European colonial project is not yet done. Uh, and he call, he's calling for a certain kind of alliance of oppressed and solidarity, really, of oppressed peoples across the world against, um, against both colonialism and against the American empire. Um, but I would want to just push to say that it might also be that in trying to think through the question of race, um, particularly as it relates to the United States, we might want to think about um, in what ways the, uh, the after back body or blackness um, is actually a perpetual enemy within the system. And if it is a perpetual enemy in the system, why? Um, how is it constructed around violence? That, that the actual ways in which racial subjugation is constructed it's through dehumanization and racial hierarchies, but its sustainability and the way violence has generated that may, also, may, may actually mean that we are, and because slavery was such a violent process and could only be and violent and sustained by violence, um, that, that what you're looking at is the, a possible way of trying to think about um, uh, 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 race as, uh, or the black or blackness or the African American has always been outside of the the system, always been the um, the disposable body, always been the person, the the, the the figure that cannot be incorporated into the body politic, and that what you may have with somebody like um, Mr. President Obama and so on are settlements or the exception. And what is interesting in the in thinking about that is. Um, when he becomes a president, the resurgence of white supremacy, the resurgence of anti-black racism, which may then suggest to us a, um, a, a, that, that, this, that this settlement was deeply upsetting to various people. And that what we are seeing now is actually a, 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 you know, a, a fight back, a real fight against that settlement. But let, let, let's, so, I mean, you know, so I, I think that's important, but I think what you're saying is, is really important for us to, uh, to also think about. I want to just go take one step back and, um, to history because we're talking about colonialism and neocolonialism and so on. And I wanted to ask you about the anti-colonial struggle in India. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you about the role of castes in that struggle. Um, and, and the role of the, Dal of the Dalit people in that struggle and, and, how, and how you see it. What's your assessment? I mean, that's a, for those of us who come from colonial countries and ex-colonial countries, the Indian struggle is extremely important with Nehru in 1947 and then the formation of Bangdong in 55 and so on, where he played a central figure, where he was a central figure. So I just I want to ask you, what was your assessment of the um, of role of caste in that struggle? Um, my view of the colonial and anti-colonial struggle of the past century is that of the uh, uh, hungry eyes and fatigued mind. I come from that uh, uh, people uh, who were made to feel that for several uh, generations uh, to come to terms with it. And so the 
colonial history or anti-colonial history in India, each caste has its own anti-colonial history. And they have, a, they have their own view of looking at this. Uh, for example, the first war of independence that happened uh, in 1857 uh, is credited to a Brahmin, uh, Sipoy, who was serving British army called Mangal Pandey. Uh, but if you look through the subaltern histories, the real hero is Mata Din Bhangi, a Dalit, who sparked that. And, and so what happens is the, the narrative of anti-colonial struggle, and that's why uh, the American, uh, the black American experiences of anti-colonial, especially India becomes central figure. And this is where I'm also writing is to, is to look at the colored cosmopolitans of what Nico Slate calls it. And it is, is, to, is, to, is, to, is to look at the color line as a deciding factor of, and, and of course, as you know, India is literally by now the leader of anti-colonial struggle, giving refuge to many African mm -hmm. nations and, you know, and, and of course, British colonial uh, space had given that. But that struggle was yet very much a struggle of the elites where people, you know, the colonial regime in India, especially for the lower caste, was in a way boon compared to the Brahminic regime. Because even though for their own selfish purposes, the British uh, 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 rule, the British, of course, crown, but also the British missionaries opened education and job spaces where they could at least you know, operate as equals uh, when, it come, when it came to working in army or, or working under in, in the British. You know. That experience was liberating for many. And that's why many uh, uh, anti-colonial fighters that came about, uh, a large portion of them had a role to play in the British army or, or, or in the British government, somehow, not directly, but, but indirectly. And, and of course, eventually uh, they had to go. But, but, but that's the kind of history. And that's not just history of Dalits. Brahmins were the first applicants to get a job under the British government. Not only British government, but also the Muslim colonial government. Uh, because they had to benefit a lot by, you know, because they were minority groups and because of the precarious situation, they were willing and they always did uh, apply, uh, you know, their own experiences uh, in, 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 in how we upholded uh, the colonial or anti-colonial experience. And, and, and I think what propagated to the rest of the colonial world was very much a Brahmin vision of anti-colonial mm -hmm. struggle where the subaltern struggles didn't even feature, you know. And even in the subaltern studies, uh, the subaltern was not necessarily a Dalit. In fact, Dalit was not even a subaltern. A subaltern was very much a non-caste category for the Brahmins who wrote about subaltern struggles. So it's, it's, it's very interesting that anti-colonial liberal was a Brahmin. Anti-colonial radical was a Brahmin. The Dalit, however, was never, as we, I argue, a human as a co-participant of that struggle. Good. Thank you very much. All right, we I'm getting my signal that we are now we should now we are now open to questions from the uh, from the audience and participants. So rhythm. Yeah. So um, the first question for um, Dr. Yangre is: I wanted to ask about how do we go about forming broad coalitions in society when, as you hinted yourself, that multiple hierarchies exist within Dalits themselves. Uh, for instance, the Indian Human Development Survey shows around 15% of Dalits themselves self-reporting um, practicing untouchability. How do, you, how do we think of regaining the basis of dignity in such situations? So is that a question for me? Yes, please. <laughs> yes. Um, I think, thank you, whoever asked that question. And uh, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, what we do is uh, we, we uh, if we have to, you know, form uh, the, 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 the struggle, you know, so if there are multiple hierarchies, that's what I'm saying. Each hierarchy should not be considered as a division necessarily, you know, but it should be considered as an aspirational. And there is nothing wrong in having aspirations uh, when, 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 you're, when you're striving for something. Good. So instead of uh, you know, uh, accounting to Dalit as responsible category, because to say, you know, if Dalits are themselves disunited, how can we, what we miss out is, we, we miss out the structural problem here. Uh, in, 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 the same, you know, in the same survey, and it was, it was, it was found 
uh, that uh, 50 percent, 55 percent of India practices untouchability. Uh, so what what that means is that we need to focus on our own kith and kin who exercise this, uh, because when we talk about practicing untouchability, the exercise of Dalit untouchability as opposed to the Brahmin untouchability or dominant caste untouchability is different. Very much what Steve Biko calls about, you know, there is a whole debate about can black be a racist, uh, you know. What we have done is we have found an easy scapegoat to blame Dalits or, or, or to identify those little loopholes and they say, you know what now, because you all have divisions, 15% of you all practicing caste discrimination and untouchability. How do I bring, bring? the point is, it's, 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 not, it's, it's none of the concern for a dominant caste to think about Dalit personal livelihoods. It's for them to then deal with their communities and not, not, to, not, to, not to get away uh, from from the from the from the Dalit experiences of, of this system as well, and I think that's why I am personally arguing for a broader uh, alliance of anti-caste movements. And what that means is you have to fight caste within your own caste as well. Dalits are fighting caste within their own caste as well, and I think that has to. That's why the multi uh, 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 the, the multi <laughs> of this uh, of this anti-caste move has to be simultaneously, I think, placed. Next question, Rudhi. Yes, thank you. Um, so the next question is by Mr. Shaheen K M. Um, they would like to know that they would like to know what your take is on Afro pessimism, the argument that suggests that no analogy can be drawn against the black experience. I think Professor Books can take the first time if you don't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mind. I don't mind it. Um, I the way I like to think about it is that there is. Um, there is no two way, two things. One, there is no. There should never be a, a kind of Olympus Olympics of oppression okay. um, that says I'm more oppressed than you are, and so on. Um, secondly, though, that there it, that does not mean that there is no that there are no historical specificities that we must not pay attention to. And uh, I am and. Uh, I think that the historical specificity of the, of the oppression of, of black folks, whether it is um, in the United States, Brazil, or in the Caribbean and elsewhere, or, or, in, parts of, or, in, or in parts of Africa, um, is, is, is extraordinary, is one of the foundations of the making of the modern world. Um, and there is no doubt about that. Um, but I also think that there are other things that are part of the way the, with, with the modern world was, 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 was made. And so that uh, I don't, I don't myself like to think in terms of analogies that okay, this is analogous to that and so on and so forth. But more always trying to think through historical specificities and, and, specific, and specific moments. But also, quite frankly, um, always uh, op operating from a particular position, which I think is important. And that is uh, that they're, they at the heart of forms of. Um, of domination, of human domination from colonialism, slavery onwards, uh, has been this business of people not being human. Mm. And therefore the question for me is, uh, how do you, how does one create a, a human, a more humane society? How does one think about um, deeply the claims of people who are oppressed that they want to be human? Um, not in a kind of humanist way in which some the West has done, but actually trying to think through different forms of being of what I like to call common association between people, certain plurality. Um, but then finally, to argue that the ways in which uh, the African American struggle and the Black struggle generally has been posed in the world, in the world as historically emerged in the world, is that it has something to say about this. I do not think it's an accident that over the last what, last four, seven, six months or so, that the Black La Black Lives Matter movement has become generative and, and catalytic um, to other movements and of solidarity and other not just of solidarity but to other movements trying to make a whole set of demands uh, and claims about hu about humanity. So that's my response. I'll just add a one or two lines to that. I think the, I'm, I'm very much with Professor Bogues on the analogy part. And I think what we do is because our mind tends to, you know, uh, you know it's, it's an experimental psychology where, you know, if you, have, if you see one 
when block open, you try to fix that block with something else. So we were trying to even out and human experiences cannot be evened out. And, and that's why when we build a solidarity, it has to be on the experiences of marginalizations and exclusions and oppressions. And I think on that, uh, there are various ways we can build upon this or else we'll never end as Professor Box said about the Olympics of oppression, because there is always something, somewhere someone is oppressing when you go to the micro level. But when we talk about the structural inequities, that's where I think we can have more, uh, you know, and, and analogous can be uh, and historical anecdotes that could help us have a common bearing. Uh, and, and I think that's important, but, but you know, we can't really uh, try to you know, uh, mimic or duplicate uh, the, the, the other existing unique forms of experiences. Okay, so the next question yes, is, uh, so the next question is that you argued that both, um, this is by Kanha Prasad, he says that you argued that both um, race and caste are nominally European constructions, um, while race became a dominant form of classification only after European colonialism. Um, you argued that caste pre-existed European colonialism, but was given a new name. Um, could you explain ways in which caste was transformed uh, in the experience of British colonialism? Yeah, I mean, it, it was more bureaucratized. It was more, it was given more prominence uh, and the classifications then started to happen according to caste. I mean, the census that happened and the jobs, well, Anil Seal uh, wrote a book in 1967 uh, on, on the British colonial experience, especially in Western India. And then, you know, there we see the classification. And this was not only in India, the classify the bureau, see, because colonialism eventually in British at least was a bureaucratic arrangement. The bureaucrats ran the country. And, and, and to, if you have to, you know, to run it, you have to keep books, you have to keep logs. And, and that's why, you know, even in Mexican society, I was reading, reading recently, uh, the various caste groups that they were under various racial broader categories were, 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 were intensified. And of course, that, that helped and also did not help. The help for the people to know how many numbers they were represented, but also for British to keep in check the over dominance of Brahmins. And, and at one point, uh, and also they wanted to, you know, they hired many princely states, many uh, kingdoms, you know, Rajputs and, and, and Marathas and others uh, were, were actually, uh, you know, part of, you know, in, in negotiation with British government. So they, had, they also had to keep in check how the administration is, is run. And I think it was uh, the process of that. Some argue that British colonial experience strengthened the caste. Uh, because, uh, because of course, it, it, it brought forth many things. But for some people, that is good. Good that you strengthen it, but because that now we could know uh, what caste group representation and how it is about. Because eventually, it was all about representation and, 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 and having uh, equal say in the affairs of the state. Okay, thanks, Rizal. Um, so the next question is by uh, Ritika Biswas. Uh, she asks if you think caste identities are primarily embedded within the geopolitical region of South Asia, and how does the South Asian diaspora carry caste and experiences of caste discrimination amongst its diaspora communities, um, especially as a foil to the visibility politics of race as carried by Black people? I think Ritika has a very important point there. And it's, it's, of course, the geopolitical experience is very unique. You go to Tamil Nadu, you go to Nepal, you go to uh, 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 some provinces of the East, and you will see the caste is, is modified. There are different names for caste. That was the genius of this, uh, or wicked genius of this person, or, or not one person, but you know, over several generations that was solidified where each group was declared untouchable. And, and, and they were maintained untouchable for long. And I think that's what the, the and, 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 and the geopolitical aspect of this was essential because caste had to be confined to a geographical limits. Eventually caste is about control. It is it's caste is about discipline. And, and for you to have that discipline, you really need a native rulership. And India as we have today was never India of, of that. You know, it was a different countries and even today, a person from different state and different state have a difficulty in communicating. It's 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 like meeting a foreigner, and of course, you know that kind of you know the the, uh, the uh, and we have to understand uh, the geographical experiences shape uh, the cultural aspects of of individual societies. Uh, they have a huge force of uh, uh, influence 
that kind of shapes one's thinking as much as culture shapes the geographical part of part of that. And and I think that's what happened uh, when these uh, groups also came to uh, you know the foreign country carrying the same psychology. And that's why when they come here, there's also the geographic affiliation. Each state group has its own association. The Telugu have their own association. The Maharashtra, and you know that's how it is going to be because it's a replication of your loyalty because people are still attuned to the idea of nation state. And that nation state model continues to have its own replications wherever they go. Okay, I think um, we are, you know, we, we have about three minutes more. Okay, can I then, could I go um, to, could we take one more question with them? And then I, I, there's a, I want to come back to the business of, um, of emancipation and liberation and the difference right, between yeah. So yeah. we have an interesting question. Um, it's quite elaborate, but I'll read it out. Uh, this is again by Kanha. Um, he asked that his second question is regarding communalism. Um, as I'm sure Dr. Yente is aware, Christopher Jaffelot and others have written about how Dalits since the 1990s have been enlisted in the Hindutva project with some degree of success. Um, Bhagavan Meghwanshi, for example, in his book, um, Why I Could Not Be a Hindu, wrote about how during the Ram Janmabhumi event, the RSS devoted enormous resources to recruiting Dalits as foot soldiers in destroying the Babri Masjid. Um, and in the ensuing communal vi violence against against Muslims. So why do you think Dalits today are attracted to the Hindutva project? Right. Uh, Professor Boggs, you had also on liberation, uh, you want to take that last question? Is that yeah, yeah. Well, let's just, if you could answer that, and then we, we just take the last one. Absolutely. Uh, thank you uh, uh, to Kana Prasad for that question. I think Dalits are not attracted to Hindutva project, you know. They are they are framed as attracted to Hindutva project. If you read through Bhavar Abhagmanshi's idea he did not go there to uh, necessarily follow uh, the you know, hindu rashtra of, of some sort for him hindu rashtra was different than what brahmins were thinking of hindu rashtra brahmins had a, it's the same concept but different idea you know uh, and for him it was about a casteless classless a kind of a society of egalitarian utopia that he was hoping to achieve and that's what was promoted but in actuality when it came to you know uh, in practice that was not the correct uh, description and but uh, but 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 the, it is right that the Dalits continue to be enlisted into the project of Hindutva, and that's why I say, let's stop using Hindutva. Hindutva is a very uh, dwarfing, limiting term. We should identify it as a Brahminic project. It's a Brahminism, uh, the 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 essential control of one caste. Hindu as a thing doesn't exist, as as a canon doesn't exist. There are various castes who are forcibly clubbed together. We have different aspirations altogether. There cannot be a Hindu as such. Because a person who's representing the Hindu causes or representing primarily their caste cause, the caste identity that they are born into. And, and that's how the aspirations uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, preclude whatever they do as, as part of a Hindu. And, and for as, as Dalits, we have, we have heavily rejected even the terminologies that we have. So it's, it's a Brahmanvad, it's a Brahminism uh, that, that kind of continues to operate under the name of Hindu. And, and for that, uh, by making it a Hindu twa, the Dalits are made to feel that they are part of Hindu order. And, 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 and by that, the Dalits have no investment in Hindu, Hindu Rashtra. They don't, they, don't wanna, they don't want to have a Hindu uh, caste regime ruling. And Bhavarim Meghwanj explains why he was at primarily attracted to it. And many Dalits will ascribe and many former RSS Dalits who left, they will tell. There is a constant fear of otherizing Muslims. Muslims are considered the enemies or the Christians. Uh, the, the religion non-native to India. And uh, this is a very theocratic understanding of how they want to present nation state. Uh, Dalits are forcibly clubbed into the Hindutva project when they do not want to, uh, you know, they, they, never, they never went uh, to, you know, uh, kill Muslim or something. And so that's why I am bringing a caste analysis there because the Muslims who the Dalits are beating as Hindus are also Dalit convert Muslims. The, the Christians that Dalits are beating as Hindus are actually the Dalit convert Christians. So we need to have that focus of a caste sentimentality. Once we do that, we'll have a more clearer picture. Great, can we, thanks very much. Uh, let me just end by just asking you to talk a little bit about um, liberation versus, eman versus um, uh, emancipation. Um, so I have been thinking about uh, these uh, notions because, uh, you know, uh, emancipation for me still is ascribing to the, uh, uh, you know, neo uh, state formations 
uh, where emancipation still means you know working and operating in a very liberal order and liberal order also gives us a lot of space to be repressive under the name of law uh, to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, extremely exploitative under the name of free market and profit making um, and it also gives much uh, uh, occasions for people who want to continue to rule uh, uh, a certain class to have to have legitimacy and emancipation is 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 attuned uh, to that idea uh, whereas when i look as freedom uh, whereas i look as a, a complete freedom i want to look at liberation because liberation for me is trying to get away from all of that what emancipation cannot offer and liberation here is is is, is, is a complete annihilation of oppressive structures and that's why i frame of course the emancipatory politics very liberal politics that do not resolve on a longer term basis which is very much Ma uh, Martin Luther King Jr. as well, uh, no, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, uh, Gandhi, as well as uh, um, the, the politics of Abraham Lincoln, where, where we see emancipation becomes a, a kind of a, a, a global doctrine acceptable and all of a sudden the oppressed has to believe in the genteel uh, uh, politeness of an oppressor because an oppressor still is in the command and control of ruling the affairs. Whereas liberation is kind of subverting that altogether. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I would just say to you, and I'll end on this, is that it's, um, that's really a very important distinction. It's also an important distinction in the um, Black Liberation Movement, um, the Movement for Black Lives, um, and uh, the entire history of Black Liberation, because to be emancipated was really to be freed from slavery from above, while while to be free and freedom or liberation was to take things into your own hands and to actually demand your own freedom because nobody can give you freedom. If I own you and I oppress you, I can't give freedom to you. Um, freedom can only be taken, um, taken by you who are oppressed. And so on that note, I would want to say thanks to everybody. Thank, to the, um, thank you very much, Dr. Um, for, for, um, for participating in this. Thank you very much for the, uh, to the organizers. And thank you all for staying with us um, uh, so long on a Sunday morning.